Um, so I'm Stefan and I'm like doing security for a long time and crypto is one of the things that I do most like for longest time I do. But I'm more a practitioner, my mathematics skills are not as developed as some of the people I may, might be sitting here. But I can show you some equations and stuff and also explain them to you. But um, I cannot get into very deep waters in, in some areas. Um, but I can, um, at the end of the talk, there's a list of links to a lot of papers and research. And I also compiled a list of all the research papers and all the documents that I'm referencing in my talk. I have quite a lot of research done. And you can download all of these uh, research papers. There's quite some interesting crypto behind that if you want to go into the details and want to, do, want, want to see how the mathematics work behind that. So I will release that after the talk, of course. So the first one. Uh, in the post Snowden era, as Cory Doctorow so well formulated, actually we have a new adversary model. And actually it's not our adversary, but app apparently there's some governments that think that the citizens are actually their adversaries. So actually if one um, actor thinks about some other actor as an adversary, that makes the other actor also the opposite uh, adversary of the other one. So that means we also need to update our threat model. Not, like, not only like um, apparently some governments, we also need to be aware that we now have, um, times have changed, and um, we now have, uh, currently I think we now have like these four main uh, adversaries that we care about currently, like we have the civilians that governments see as adversaries. We have normal criminals that we still fight in uh, fishing and banking and whatever. Then we have the industrial adversaries, uh, where actually companies do um, um, reduce security and um, penetrate and whatever. And then we have this new adversary, this is the totalitarian um, adversary, who is actually mostly about having huge unlimited black budgets that are unaccounted for, um, operates outside the law, but it's always called legal, like legal interception, legal blah blah blah, legal whatever, just because you are uh, prepending the word legal and change the laws to make it legal doesn't make it like, you know, um, also fair and just. Um, and and uh, there's this other thing with this totalitarian adversary is that apparently it is able to store all our communication and especially the communication that is encrypted and interesting to him. So that means it, uh, all our encrypted communication is actually stored, possibly, that is routed through any of our adversaries for indefinite time until this encrypted content can be opened up. That might mean that our PGP mails will be decrypted in five years from now when you become a target of a targeted attack that is only for extracting your crypto keys, nothing else. So they can read all your mails back and whatever. Um, so um, after these revelations we had like, I think it's kind of, you see, I, I call it first psyops, but also psychology like this this hysteria that, that, that has been, can be seen in the media where, where all these stories about crypto are dumbed down to the level as yesterday has been said that uh, SSL and crypto is totally broken. That is not, absolutely not true. It's a very, uh, uh, actually a bad simplification of the state so that actually people can understand, but it has nothing to do actually uh, with reality as I will show you in this talk. Um, so the reaction of the people after the Snowden revelations, I think, is, is pretty um, um, irresponsible from, from, from some point of view, but I will show you another viewpoint. And I'm very happy to have a discussion about uh, these two um, viewpoints. So the civilian reaction is to have crypto parties where people meet and try to teach each other um, um, PGP usage, Tor usage, and, and maybe some other tools. Um, I always think about, I will show you later that uh, security is, is something that you do in depth and that has a, had a, lot, a lot of layers. And simply putting up one layer somewhere on top while your base is totally fragile doesn't make much difference. But I will show you a different view on this in a sec. 
Yes, we need OPSEC parties, definitely. That is my, yeah. Um, then you have crypto cats where all kinds of people think of still want to have it in a convenient way. So they want to do their crypto and their security in their browser. And then there are more crazy people who want to do this in their phones, but I'm not going to talk about them really. Um, so, and then we have even in the W3C, we have uh, the standardization of web crypto. Um, I think, as I will show you later, without firm foundations, this does not make any sand, uh, sense. Uh, smartphone crypto, I already ad addressed that. I think um, as, so, as, as long as the baseband processor is not controlled by us and has, like, um, maybe in some phones you have a, a baseband firewall, but other si otherwise, um, from the network, your phones can be completely owned. Maybe from the user side, you have good sandboxing and uh, isolation and stuff. Maybe it's more difficult to go from that side, but um, this totalitarian adversary might not come that way. Um, so here's the opposite viewpoint. John Callas, he's one of the co-authors of PGP. It's a bit long um, um, quote, but he tells that he's, he, he talks about uh, security arrogance. When we, people tell, when we tell people that only, there's, there's only like, you need to do, go here for uh, having any kind of security, and if you just use PGP, that is nothing because it just creates a false sense of security. I think, um, and, and I, I, this quote is actually pretty important because it shows this other viewpoint that we need to find a way for people to cross the security chasm, to show them that just simply because of you have this hysteric reaction to to, to the Snowden revelations, uh, and, and you now go to a crypto party and use PGP, that um, you, is, is actually a good, a good thing, but you need to realize uh, how limited your protection is when using PGP. It's not a silver bullet. And my problem with, with these kinds of, of events is uh, I think they, they seem to promise a kind of silver bullet, which they don't at all. And this is something uh, which I think is most important with all this. Um, I encourage everyone to go to crypto parties and use PGP and, and teach that. But you need to also show that it's only a very tiny defense and you need to do a lot more. And I'm going to talk a bit uh, later on host security and OPSEC as well. Um, so basically, uh, when you go to a crypto party and didn't do anything uh, besides bring your laptop and, and then you go get some PGP keys and, and start to learn that, um, you are still against an, an unforgetting, lawful, hyper-resourceful adversary um, who has been doing this game for at least 50 to 60 years against professionals. So the chasm is big and there's a lot of things to do. But I think it's not impossible, actually. There's a lot of things that you can do and that you can be careful of. But uh, I don't advocate, actually, at all going to a crypto party and installing PGP on your Windows host that has not been updated in the last three years, right? That doesn't make much sense. It doesn't, like, what kind of security does this provide? Um, so um, when, we, when you go to a crypto party or when you start to, like, to react to, to what happened in the revelations from Snowden and this uh, hyper-resourceful adversary, uh, the first uh, case is in, in this picture, you have unencrypted communications between two peers that is most easily intercepted uh, in the middle in the communication channel. This is, this is like how most people communicate today without any kind of encryption and without um, not having most any kind of protection on their host. So after the crypto party, what happens? Um, this middle link goes from green to black, so that means the, it is uh, encrypted, uh, but that shifts act actually the attack vector, the attack surface, to the part where you can actually still access uh, the unencrypted communication, and that is at the old end point. So as soon as you start encrypting, um, your communication is not the main target anymore, but it's your hosts, right? So you, you should think about, after deploying encryption, you should think about uh, how to secure your host. Um, because this is one of my favorite slides from the Spy Files 3. Um, this is showing the DreamLab infection proxy that is infecting um, um, binary installer downloads on the fly. So when you download like Skype or iTunes or whatever, they intercept that download and patch it with a dropper for their own malware Trojan. So basically that means, um, oh sorry, 
that means um, it's pretty easy to attack also the endpoints if you are a person of interest. Or uh, in some cases, actually, um, if you, as I'm showing here in the picture, you see these black dots. But people never operate in a vacuum. They always communicate with other people, right? So that means if I'm, I'm protecting my communications, you are protect or my host, you're protecting your host, and we are protecting our crypto, then the attacker goes to traffic analysis and, and like we also know from the NSA, that there's uh, three degrees of, of connections that are being tracked. So that means it's, it's your family and your friends. And maybe if you're um, a journalist or maybe if you're um, a civil rights um, activist, that means actually um, the focus of the adversary is, is, is focused on the people that you actually fight for, what you want to protect. So, so you need to be, this is like, um, if you, and then of course also the people can be attacked on the end host, so this is only the communication links now. But if you, if you consider like a, a wide scale, I think this is just a matter of evolution. I don't know how far we are into this de uh, development, but it's not a big uh, question that if you have infection proxies already now, then those can be also deployed on a, on a wider scale. If it's only like the NSA does for extracting <laughs> crypto material so that they can decrypt your keys, right? Um, so the question is, would you want to have surgery over the internet? Um, I guess no. It's, um, security is turtles all the way down. Um, and this is like, it is not only PGP, right? We, we need psychological security because like when you are, security is nothing else than agency, the possibility to act. And if you're like, psychologically blocked because you're, uh, you, you, you are you have under stress, you have fear or something, or you fear for your family. That is also some kind of security. You need physical security. Actually, there's some things that I didn't write on this, uh, on this slide, but you, have, you need financial security. You need legal security as well. Um, but you know, Al Capone has been caught by, by his taxes, right? Um, so there's all kinds of, um, of things that you, um, that, the turtles go down very, very deeply, right? Also, um, just recently at the other camp, Ohm, there was an excellent presentation of hacking hard disk firmware, where a guy was installing a backdoor in the firmware of a hard disk. And after you reinstalled your system, your, your, your operating system, you wiped everything clean, and you have a completely clean operating system. The guy can activate the backdoor in the uh, hard disk firmware from remote, and then he has access to the system again, even though you, you have a completely clean system, but you cannot really clean. How, and how many people can clean their hard disk firmware here now? There's one, I guess, yes, two. Wow, awesome. So, um, um, so, so it's, it's quite a, a lot of things that we need to, to think about in this case. And uh, there's also some people who, who think of, of, of physical security of their laptops, so like to disable all the ports that you don't need and never, never need HDMI and, and stuff like that that are uh, open for DMA um, attacks and stuff like that. So also the open uh, operating system. So security is always like shown as a trade-off. And what I try to teach people when I, I'm, I'm doing some kind of trainings in this regard, I always talk about security and all the chores that you need to do. Uh, and the most, most tedious chores is key management. Is actually, it's not something that you do out of pleasure, but this is some kind of hygiene. This is like brushing your teeth. You don't brush your teeth because you enjoy that, but you, you'd brush your teeth because you have a long-term investment into this activity. This is your health your well-being. And exactly the same is true for, for key management. This is about your well-being and your hygiene. This is the digital hygiene. And the chores that you need to do here are, are not something that you do out of fun. So it's not really a trade-off. It is like brushing your teeth. Okay? Um, so it's also a mindset. You need to question. It's a process. There's no 100%. This is more a slide for normal people who have never um, um, uh, met someone with a hacker mindset, I guess. So I think the last uh, point on the slide is also important that um, we need to also realize that the attacker and the defender are in a very asymmetric position. Attackers only have to succeed once and, and then they are successful already, but defenders can only fail once. It's a completely different, you can only fail as a defender, you can never win. As an attacker you can only win. And, uh, and this is, uh, I think this mindset needs also to be understood because it leads to quite far because it means that sooner or later we all will be owned.
I guess. That needs to be realized. And I think this is uh, my first video that I want to show. Um, what? Internet C? Okay. This is from, I think, 2011, Black Hat Europe, Whitfield Diffie, one of the guys who came up with the Diffie Ham and Key Exchange protocol in the 70s. And he's giving a, a talk on the general state of security in 2011. And I think what he's been saying two years ago is incredibly relevant also today. And I have three segments from his talk that I'm going to show you, and then that is. Um, Basically, um, on layer that says, you know, yeah, yeah, there if I can. Can um, is this for the short time we can switch down the light? Is that okay? On, on layer that says, you know, yeah, yeah, there if I can. And similarly, I'm not suggesting that you can't do secure things within the internet, but I'm suggesting that the internet itself can in no more meaningful sense be secure than, maybe, you know, than the oceans are secure. There are security activities in the oceans, there is law of the sea, there are many aspects of it, but the functioning of humanity has depended on the openness and diversity of the seas, and I think it depends similarly on the openness and diversity of the internet, with the incredible difference, of course, that we didn't we didn't build the seas, and we are building the internet. So basically, the message is here that this diversity and this insecurity of the internet is a generative uh, attribute without which uh, the internet wouldn't exist, actually. Um, I think this is a very interesting and a very insightful. Um, we will come back to this uh, idea in a sec. Um, so let's see a bit of history, because crypto is not broken since yesterday, right? So there's a history, um, oh, this is, oh, the screenshot is much better than here. So this is a screen, uh, screenshot of, a, of a, an article of the um, New York Times from 83. This is, this is 30 years old stuff. And it actually, if you read that, it is like if, if it's some kind of article on the Snowden revelations. Um, so uh, the NSA is, is operating for quite some time already in this area, and I'm going to show you some examples of um, um, another tr uh, 10 years later, this is also an incredibly interesting quote, I think. This is a quote from an NSA uh, report that was submitted after the Eurocrypt 93 conference, which was held here in Hungary. And uh, the NSA guy submitted a report on all the talks. And what he says that the last four sessions are absolutely of no interest to us, and this is good news. So uh, his conclusion is that civilian cryptographers are doing something completely and uninteresting from the NSA viewpoint. I, I, I want to remind you this is from 20 years ago. Things might have changed. Um, but he is also commanding that the scholarship is good. So it's actually just a different direction that is interesting for the NSA. But I think this is an interesting quote. Um, and what he says in the first sentence is three of the last four sessions uh, were of no value whatsoever. So what are these, what were those, lo those last four sessions? Um, I think it's quite interesting because, I've, uh, yeah, this is, this is the source. This is uh, uh, the crypto log um, released. The NSA has an internal um, paper, which they release uh, regularly. And uh, I think a couple of months ago, uh, a lot of these papers have been released, uh, like 30 years or, or something like that, until the late 90s. And what were those last four sessions? The last four sessions were digital signatures. I think pretty interesting concept, actually. Electronic cash, again, an interesting concept. Complexity theory and cryptography, too. Of course, cryptography, too, was the one that was interesting to the NSA guy. But the other three topics, I think, are also interesting. And they are crypto, but maybe not interesting to the NSA. But that was 20 years ago. Maybe now, with Bitcoin and other stuff, maybe there's a change in that. Um, so. And this other thing that I think is also interesting um, is that he's actually saying there's no novel crypt analysis and no, nothing really happening. This is 93. Um, so this is like a, a very bad opinion on civilian cryptography, on what is happening, I think. So um, 
This gives a pretty interesting insight into what might be happening inside the NSA. I will be showing you some other quotes uh, in, a, in a bit, um, I guess. Um, but first, let's go back for a sec for, to Whitfield Diffie, who has something else to say, not only about the security of the internet, but also about the security of uh, implementations and crypto. said everything else is rotten. Uh, crypto implementation is, you know, somewhere from fair to dreadful in most things. Uh, when you hear about things being broken, it isn't, I say, invariably, because the, uh, the implementations have failures, either failures imaginative enough, you know, far-fetched enough, you shouldn't have noticed them to start with, or just plain blunders. And the key management, in particular, key production is rather crummy. So, exactly. So, what Whitfield Diffie says here, it's, it's still true, I think, but this is diluted by the messages from the Snowden revelations, that it's, the crypto actually works. It's always the implementations that suck or are subverted or, you know, OpenSSL has been developed by a guy who thought this is a good way to learn C. Um, think about that. So, in the history, has also shown there's a lot of crypto AGs. So, the, uh, the name comes from crypto AG, right? So, the, the NSA actually subverted a company to, to uh, backdoor uh, their cryptographic uh, material. But uh, m not much later, we also had the revelation by Duncan Campbell about the NSA key in Windows. There's actually two NSA keys, turns out later. Uh, Lotus Notes has been backdoored by the NSA. I'm sorry. Um, we know from um, John Gilmore, who has been on the IPsec um, development list, that there was active interference with making IPsec secure. This has been like commented by him recently on these backdooring of, of, the, of all your crypto implementations. From OpenBSD, we have like this report on this mailing list by one guy and it turned out that it was correct that some um, governmental, fed, federal um, contractors were working on the IPsec stack in OpenBSD and there were some like deliberate bugs in introduced. I'm going to show you an extra slide on SSL on how many times um, SSL has been broken, but actually the question with SSL is I, I think again very um, typical because SSL is so convoluted and so complex that it's very, very hard to even implement correctly. So. Uh, all these bugs are actually a result of that. GSM as such, uh, we can, um, we, we will see later on. It's, it's basically an open network. Um, it, is, it, is, it is relying on uh, obscurity uh, and, and, uh, um, and not real security and then home-cooked um, crypto algorithms um, that are deliberately weakened as well. Um, so uh, with RSA, we know they have been infiltrated. Um, and a lot of their material has been, I guess, by the Chinese or something. We know about Hushmail, they have been backdoored by, uh, by the government. Uh, by, by, there was a court order and, and Hushmail actually uh, backdoored their own Java client so they could um, intercept the mail from, I guess, some criminal. Um, and we recently also saw that Google is being actively man in the middle attacked by the NSA. They simply reroute and possibly they have also the keys or um, uh, this needs some research on how this works, but it's HTTPS traffic that is man in the middle attacked by the NSA that goes directly to Google. So there's a lot of crypto against already um, and we have a long history and this is just a non-representative non list, but this happens all the time. Also, I will show you in, in concrete algorithms and stuff. So with SSL, here's a short list on, on all these attacks that have appeared since last, the last 10 years or something. It, think, it, it starts with a padding oracle attack, which is a pretty exciting attack. Uh, most of the other attacks are um, um, developments uh, based on the um, padding oracle attack. This has been deployed also in, in uh, cracking other algorithms. This is, this is a, a pretty cool attack. Um, I guess you know all these others. Some of them are more theoretical, but for example, this breach attack seems still uh, is still open. And um, under some, if you are on the local network and stuff, then you, it might be exploited and stuff. RC4, apparently, we know from a research paper from 
um, Daniel J. Bernstein that with uh, two to the 28 calculations we can recover the first um, I don't know 128 bytes of any RC4 encrypted stream um, so I think this is quite feasible nowadays so RC4 is broken basically um, then what uh, with PGP I think this the first uh, the top uh, shows you this, this graph shows you the the amount of new key registrations per day and I think this is a, a pretty cool thing that people actually started using more and generating new keys and and this is more than a double in increase per, uh, on a daily rate of new PGP keys I think this is pretty cool the problem is I don't recommend PGP too much I have I have some problems with PGP and the first problem is it's it created incredibly easy to identify and fingerprint so if you are a DPI or if you are a forensic uh, researcher all your tools have the first um, menu item in the extract things is PGP most of the time so PGP has a pretty um, uh, recognizable signature open PGP packets are very recognizable the other thing with PGP is actually it provides no perfect forward secrecy that means as soon as your keys get compromised and the adversary who's storing all your messages has access to that he can retroactively decrypt all your messages so PGP actually doesn't protect you in the long term so we need short session keys or something that you rotate very quickly or something there's a few uh, proposals like there's an um, IET pro proposal and there's Steed that is a proposal by the open PGP guys um, actually the Steed proposal is pretty static I'm not so sure I like that and the other proposal is also pretty static it it doesn't try to change PGP in a fundamental way to allow uh, perfect forward secrecy and I, I'm not sure also um, PGP actually the all the all the symmetric encryption algorithms they only provide you uh, encryption but no authentication so that means um, um, actually um, the crypto can be um, actively um, attacked because the authenticity cannot be verified um, so I can change and um, um, authenticate it um, data and then the fourth one is we don't still have no elect elliptic uh, curve cryptography and PGP uh, there's code committed since I think almost two years now in the GPG code base but it has never been released I think it's still pretty um, experimental but there was a patch like I guess eight years ago or something someone already produced something like that but um, ECC is something as we will see later that is I think can be considered has a higher security margin um, due to its key size and um, but I will come back to that in a sec so uh, and going back to the implementations also we were talking about Java and uh, web crypto and stuff like that um, Firefox actually if you want to do any kind of crypto I wouldn't trust my Firefox with anything of that there's there's no compartmentalizations there's no real sandboxes uh, there's no TLS 1.2 support still they have it in uh, committed in git already but it will come out or maybe in, in Firefox 26 or something and that is the only non-broken TLS suit uh, on today so Firefox doesn't support any of the non-broken ones uh, this one actually and then what I also I'm kind of uh, pissed with is um, they don't provide actually or it's really difficult to find signed builds so if I like you know the infection proxy from earlier if I if I install Firefox and I don't check the signature the PGP signature on it it might be infected so I really want to check if it's really signed by the developers of Mozilla so this is the PGP key is not shown on the website whatsoever you actually have to go to this ugly um, pass that is nowhere uh, released and if you see this this is actually HTTP so um, what the hell eh? so and then when you you think okay I'm smarter than you guys I'm going to HTTPS this this is Mozilla right so um, it says you wanted to connect to getfirefox.com but if you click on the on the certificate it says it's only good for WWC Mozilla and w, uh, uh, star uh, Mozilla.com so they provide a wrong certificate a fucking 
awful warning message that deters you from checking the validity of, of your download of the PGP keys, right? And you, even the PGP keys can only be downloaded with HTTP. And there's not, I, we're not even talking that they have SSL and we want them to use PFS suits. No, they don't even, there's nothing like that. And, and look at this hostile um, warning. This is like, how can you do that? And as long as we have this kind of infrastructure, there's no way of doing JavaScript crypto in a, in a browser. Um, that you cannot trust your fundamentals. How do you, how would you trust it with your keys, right? So, and then we have some OTR apps because what I think currently um, from a cryptographic protocol point of view, the least broken protocol that we have at the moment is actually OTR. Um, it has perfect forward secrecy. You can rotate keys. It can be quite anonymous. So actually OTR is the thing to do um, if you want to, but it's not good for sending files or so. So there's, there's a lot of things to, to work on and I will come back to this. But there's, currently there's like two, to clients and Jitsi is one that I checked out and apparently Jitsi has a home cooked OTR implementation that was written before the OTR spec was ready and <clears throat> um, it's written in Java if anyone wants to have a look and break it completely please um, um, and, and, and apparently they never implemented the socialist um, millionaire protocol so the only way to ensure trust between two communicating partners is to verify fingerprints. However, if you use an anonymous system like Tails that generates new fingerprints on every boot, how do you verify fingerprints with someone remote? There's only way to actually build trust is the socialist mi multi uh, millionaire protocol in the setting, and they don't provide that. So, so Jitsi is something I cannot recommend to anyone at this point in time. Uh, I would like to, if any one of you has some Java breaking expertise, please do it, submit it, and make them fix this. Uh, Pigeon is the other thing, it's written in C, and uh, Jacob Applebaum is a, uh, is a guy who, who likes to pick on the uh, Pigeon guys, and um, he has submitted a, a lot of bugs, um, but I guess it's getting ha uh, better and better. I think this is the same has actually happened to Windows, like the Windows guys and Microsoft has been bashed so much that with some time actually their security increased, right? And the same happened also, I guess, with Pigeon, with, with all this Jacob bashing. Uh, so, go ahead. There's also XMPP client, which is a horrible command line uh, Java client written in Go. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't be recommended. Which one? XMPP dash client. Okay, XMPP dash client. Uh, the, one I, that I, the one that I recommend, it's not a graphical one, I recommend MacAbber. That is also the default one in OpenBSD. It's a console based one. Uh, pretty hostile to noobs. Um, but I have, a, I have a key alias mapping. If someone wants that, that makes it quite convenient. Sorry? MacAbber. M A M C A B B E R. You are, so, the, you are both here also in Gajim? Yeah, I got you. And I use it. So I don't know if it's. But these, uh, again, to, rem to remind you. So I think those three last ones that you mentioned all use the libpurple yeah. uh, C library, which is the same no, as Pigeon. No, uses. no, MacAbra doesn't. No, no MacAbra uses lib. Um, what? I will, I will look that up, but uh, MacAbber uses a completely different uh, library. But libOTR it does. It is libOTR, but not libPigeon, uh, libPurple, but they use another XMPP layer. Loud, loud phone, loud speak, or something like loud, loud mouth. Lib loud mouth, right. Um, that's lib. So, and then, um, yeah, ZRTP apps, and voice encryption and stuff like that. Actually, you can make your, your I think with ZRTP and SRTP, you can actually encrypt your communication and it's pretty good protocol, but I think it lacks all the other important protections that we like with, you can, uh, you cannot hide your, against traffic analysis because you need a extremely low latency network. So, so the communication partners will always be identified. They will be leaking some kind of metadata. Not very much, you can hide most of the data with your own protocols, but, um, um, there's still a lot of things that you can do and with ZRTP and, and, and voice and video apps. That is pretty hard and um, I don't know how to do that. If it's okay if, if uh, the, the 
the communication is only encrypted, but traffic analyzing and so on is not important, then of course it's pretty cool. So again, also what Whitfield Diffie said, key management is key. And with key management how, and also key production, what he was referring to. The first thing is what is extremely important with key management is RNGs, random number generators. Where do you get your entropy, right? We all remember Debian and all these other fine RNGs that, that starved the entropy pools, had a very low entropy, and all our cool uh, SSH server keys that were generated right after booting without an entropy pool. They all generated the same keys, and this is what actually broke the Debian OpenSSL thing. Ephemerals, we actually, we should, if you want to perfect forward secrecy, we need ephemeral keys. That means we need to exchange keys quickly and fast, and, and we need to also have a way to, uh, to delete them. This is uh, two points later. Actually, deletion, deletion of keys on a uh, normal hard disk is okay, but on, on flash disk is pretty hard. Uh, the life cycle, also how you revoke of, uh, keys and stuff like that. Usually, these are completely neglected things. People, people just start encrypting, but don't think about how they manage their keys, how they store them, where they store them, how to revoke them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are all extremely important. Access, also you mentioned, do you want to store your keys on your host, or do you want to offload that to some special device that is maybe a bit more hardened and contains all your keys, and it makes it more difficult to actually get to your key material. <clears throat> so also the key size is important. Um, I will show you some crypto algorithms that have huge key sizes, like where public key is like 46 kilobytes big. Um, and this is not RSA. Um, and then uh, if we go to the other opposite end, we will see elliptic curve cryptography with pretty short keys, which, are, which means that the security margin is pretty high. And, and then, of course, the last thing is we need to reverse engineer the tools that we use. Otherwise, we have no way of knowing whether the tools that we are use are not backdoored. I will show you some, or will um, show you some backdoors later um, that are pretty interesting. So uh, let's go back to Diff Whitfield Diffie for a sec. The last time. When you don't want. To 2005 is 90 years. Algorithms are in good shape, but Everything else is. So, you know, what, why are the problems in the chip? Well, as I said, we've been working on it for 90 years. Important point, we'll get back to it in a second. Um, but I'm pretty convinced that cryptography hasn't saved the world the way I and some other people thought it would only 40 years ago. Um, it is not because the algorithms aren't good. No. So that's at the algorithms shortly. So, first, RNGs. We all heard about dual EC DRBG. This is the backdoor RNG algorithm from the National Institute of Standards and Technology that has been just recently disclosed by, but we know f about this since like 2007. If you look it up on Wikipedia, there is already this claim. So shortly after NIST published this, there was crypto analysis by some IBM guys and they, at a, uh, I think, Azure Crypt drum session in 10 minutes, they just gave a talk that this might be backdoored. And we know about this since then, actually. Um, how it has been backdoored? Actually, the algorithm is pretty good. The only thing is that they leak too many bits of, of the internal state. They actually, they actually um, use half of the internal state as the output of the RNG. And since you have half of the internal state, uh, it's pretty easy to use uh, those bits to actually predict all the next bits of the RNG. So it's like um, you don't even need to know what is um, um, like seeding the RNG because the RNG itself leaks the next things. And I will show you another. This is some kind of kleptography. If you, there's a uh, kleptography as a way to break crypto by subverting the crypto. I will, this is like something like that. You simply choose weak constants or stuff like that. We will see some of those as well. So, so um, there's another myth. Actually, Linux dev random is good. People think it's not good and if it blocks and stuff like that. Actually, the crypto behind dev random is pretty strong and good. The only thing is it needs to be seeded. This was the problem with, with Debian and everything else. So the problem is um, if you are shortly after booting and have no, you don't have a random source, 
then you might starve your entropy, and then you, you might get bad random. So this is something that you need to know. But um, as soon as your uh, RNG is seeded, it provides actually pretty good random for a very long time. You just need a good seed once. Uh, there's another problem. Um, virtual machines are usually sharing their uh, um, entropy, and they can be extremely starved. Um, so for them, for virtual machines, we need to find out something how to provide them uh, with good entropy sources. Um, it, it's extremely easy. Not all, uh, there's other ways to backdoor uh, um, um, RNGs. One of the simplest ways, if you have a counter and you simply use AES in counter mode, and you output the counter where you encrypt one, and you output uh, or the, uh, with a zero or whatever, like you always encrypt the same thing with a changing uh, IV, which is a counter, for example. And, and the output of that is looking to you totally random. You will have no idea whether this output is not random or, or something. But if I know what your seed is, what is the first counter, I can actually pretty fast uh, break uh, um, brute force what is uh, the counter now, and then I have access to the entropy. Uh, so actually what we need is a continuous, this is CSRNG, this is a continuously seeded RNG. That means we continuously seed uh, our RNG from entropy sources, hardware or whatever, and uh, we mix it, and then we hash it or we process it in some way, and this is the output. And this is actually some way also like the Intel uh, RUND uh, um, instructions in, in newer Intel CPUs seem they don't release the, uh, the specs. We don't know how it is backdoored. So if you, however, you, you can still use it if you mix it with other random sources that are not controlled by Intel. Uh, that is actually something that you can do. Uh, you can use 18, uh, eight uh, dices with 16 faces. That is pretty cool for generating AES keys. You just throw them and you have an AES key and it's totally random. And uh, also you can use a deck of cards. Actually, if you use a deck of cards with 52 uh, cards, and any random uh, shuffling of that is about 218 bits of randomness. Um, consider this. And also, if you have any kind of uh, comp uh, PC that can run hardware git, uh, that is a random number, uh, random source that is based on timings of your CPU instructions, how long they run. This is a pretty good random source as well. Um, so hardware entropy resource, uh, sources. There are some interesting. There's a, a tool called Entropy Key which is out of stock now, but they promise it will be deliverable maybe at the end of the year. I like that a lot. Uh, there's like atmospheric noise from radio. Um, you can measure um, nuclear um, um, decay, uh, radioactive decay, um, and all kinds of stuff. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways. The thing is, you need to be aware there's a bias in what comes out, and you need to counter this bias, maybe with whitening or something. Uh, and you need to mix these things. This is not. This is like if you have like a thermal uh, sensor, and you have it's it's pretty has lots of digits of precision, and you l use the last digit. There might be a bias in that that there's like a chance that one appears more often than anything else, right? And you need to be aware of that. So it needs some measurements, and then you need to counteract to that. Uh, but you can use those uh, if you if you if you research the. Um, the source that you want to use. So um, let's see uh, the last quote from the Eurocrypt 93 NSA report, which says, um, you should read that actually. It says there were only two talks on elliptic curve cryptography and we are fortunate because the civilian cryptographers still haven't caught interest in that. Um, so this is interesting. The NSA considered elliptic curve cryptography something strong, and they thought that this is good, that civilians are, have not yet encountered that. Um, this is from the report from 94. So let's have a look at elliptic curves. Elliptic curves are basically curves that are based on polynomials, somehow in some space. And uh, these are two formats that both can be used to describe the same curve but in, in, in different formats. The first one is a Montgomery uh, format for describing a curve, and the second one is the Edwards uh, curve uh, or format. Usually, I don't know if you have 
or remember mass, it's the Vias transform that is used for describing curves. But these curves are actually much, much easier to use. And this is actually the point. If you use ECC, you should use curves that are easy to implement. And the curves that have been proposed by NIST and NSA are extremely hard to implement correctly. But if you use curves that have been researched and are good, then actually these are easy to implement also against timing attacks and stuff like that. So um, um, Edward curves are the curves that should be used currently and that you, you should, they should be convertible into Montgomery curves for doing some kind of mathematical operations uh, more efficiently. Um, the other thing is with elliptic curves, they are points. They are points on a curve, right? So they have like a pattern and if you send points over the wire in an unencrypted way, like a public key, uh, that is recognizable because it's always in some uh, certain interval. So actually, elliptic curve um, key material is pretty identifiable. Uh, so it needs to be stretched, and there's a way to do that. Uh, Daniel Bernstein came up with alligator, who processes the elliptic curve points into something else. Uh, crypto constants, this is also an interesting point. Uh, how do you choose your constants? Because, uh, for example, with um, uh, one of the Edward curves that is very famous, this is 2519. Uh, these are the exponents in this equation, actually, uh, in this first one. Um, um, what did I want to say about that? That's my thought. Um, oh, yeah, the crypto constant. Uh, you need to declare where they come from. And the NSA does, doesn't. And when Daniel Bernstein says he has this uh, nothing up my sleeve crypto, and he chooses his constants from historical books from 50 years ago from some mathematical um, release. So he says, no one could have backdoored that 50 years ago and thought that I will use this as the constant that I'm using. And cryptography is also an interesting thing. The, the algorithm itself can be backdoored in a way, like um, for example, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, you can actually uh, tweak the exponent that you use that will leak your next exponent already in the current packet. And this whole exponent is encrypted in the public key, uh, with public key cryptography. That means that only the person who has the secret key is able to extract the next exponent from the key exchange. Everyone else, this is protected by, by public key crypto. No one else can even prove, just by looking at the output, that the algorithm is backdoored. You need to reverse engineer. When you reverse engineer the algorithm, it will be obvious that this is a kleptographic implementation of ECDH, which actually leaks your uh, exponent in each packet, the next exponent in the current packet, actually. And you can chain that. And all your communication that is protected via ECDH is actually imp uh, immediately also uh, compromised. Uh, this is a very nice clip. I have linked this paper also, or it is in, in the batch. So cryptographic building box, uh, blocks, uh, important is uh, authenticated encryption uh, and authenticated encryption with additional data. That is basically, uh, ham instead of age mapping or, or encrypting and age mapping, you have algorithms that do this uh, in, in one step. And with associated data, you have also some plain text data outside of the encrypted stream, basically, which is also protected by the HMAC or something else. But there's, there's nowadays algorithms that actually might be able to do that, but they may be patented and have not so much interest or something. Um, so um, whenever you think of uh, any kind of uh, symmetric crypto, it should always be authenticated. So always check out, like, it should have some uh, authenticated uh, encryption mode um, available which like P PGP doesn't support uh, currently. Uh, perfect forward secrecy, I have covered this already. Continuous seeded um, RNGs again. Um, public key uh, authenticated key exchanges is also interesting. This is something where you not only exchange keys, but they're also authenticated either through a password or through some other shared secret. And that actually also deters active men in the middle attacks on your key exchange. This is a pretty cool thing. Uh, actually, the next one is not a separate thing, but an example of the PIG. Uh, SRP is a widely known um, such uh, an algorithm. And just last month, the patent on the augmented ECHA or ECHA2 um, um, algorithm also expired, which means that um, this authenticated um, key exchange um, got much freer nowadays. Then, of course, if you want to do um, uh, key stretching or, or um, 
um, hashing your password is something, as uh, in your talk I also said, script and PPKDF uh, are two algorithms that should be always used instead of, of um, when you do um, password hashing or something, or generate keys from a simple um, low entropy input like passwords. And then, of course, zero knowledge systems. These are, there's some pretty exciting uh, stuff coming up with free coins, uh, and, and brands have some kind of um, centralized infrastructure. And then, of course, multi party calculations are extremely cool. Consider this you have a secret key distributed uh, 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 across different jurisdictions across the world, and they engage in a cryptographic multi party computation to encrypt something or decrypt something with their shared secret key. But the shared secret key will never in one place. It's a, it's a, it's a distributed calculation, actually, the decryption of the stuff. Uh, and no one ever has the complete key. This is, this is something, I think, pretty exciting. Um, you can call, talk about, OK. And then um, before my talk, some of the guys came up, oh, we should also talk about post-quantum crypto. Um, I think we should. Um, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I have good news. Actually, only public key cryptography is affected by post-quantum cryptography. There's two, two um, mathematical intractable, intractable problems that can be solved with quantum. And this is uh, um, fa a number, f uh, pri uh, number factorization. And the other one is the discrete log problem to calculate discrete logarithms um, in closed fields. Um, so that means RSA is gone. That also means, most possibly, elliptic curve cryptography as such will be done in like 10 years or something when we have big enough quantum computers. Still, be, the size of the quantum computers available is not enough. So there's a lot of crypto systems that actually work. All symmetric crypto will not be broken. This is cool. So you can still use all that. Um, then we have actually very old a uh, post-quantum secure crypto system like the McElise system and the Niederreiter system, which is like an um, expansion or a further development on the McElise system. So you see these are like f almost 40 or 30 years old algorithms. So this is like, this is major crypto. None of these has been broken, or if they have been broken, they have been actually hardened and they're still like um, adopted, so um, the newer versions are not. And just lately, Daniel J. Bernstein again came out with MacBits, which, are, it, which seems to be uh, Niederreiter scheme that is um, a very modern uh, interpretation and seems to be considering all the attacks so far this is pretty interesting. Also, you can do hash-based crypto. Actually, you can you can do signatures and uh, also some kind of crypt uh, with with Lamport uh, hashes. And I have two times Kramer Shoop here. I don't know why, but uh, Kramer Shoop is actually a, a, a really exciting crypto system for me because it's the first uh, crypto system that is. Um, resistance against adaptive uh, cipher text uh, attacks. Um, so that means the attacker can send as many cipher texts as he wants and, and adapt his and he can do whatever and this is like the first scheme that is also post-quantum and that is also um, no, it's actually not post-quantum. I don't know why it's here. It's actually based on number factorization the DCR. Um, whatever. Um, Lattice-based lattice crypto is also interesting. It's basically you have a mesh net, which is defined by a base vector. And then you have a point in the network somewhere, which you distort with some kind of error. And that is like your um, secret key. And recovering the closest point in this mesh network is a hard problem if you don't have the base vector. That is your secret, basically. And that is your public key. And that is hard to, to retract. It is, um, 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 yeah, Scala vector. Um, yeah, there's one tool that actually implements the Niederreiter scheme. This is CodeCrypt. This is available on GitHub. This is done by Exa Exa, so you can play with the Niederreiter and and Macalise crypto systems. These crypto Macalise has a crypto has a key size of 46 kilobyte currently. Niederreiter has a smaller key size already. So never give up, fight. Um, and I want to ask you, all of you guys, mostly the pen testers of you to please review all these tools that we're using. I think this is really important. All these implementations that we're using need a lot of review. And if you have a weekend or something, please spend on, on reviewing some of the tools that are widely used. Uh, I think this is incredibly important nowadays. Um, so, and then 
we should deploy also the verifier builds. So like for example for Firefox or something, there's a, there's a lot of tools that are already there, like um, Gitian for automated builds that are also somehow verifiable. Um, Tahoe for distributed storage of data is an exciting thing. I think um, I operating a, a, a grid myself and it's a pretty cool thing, but um, you can't do real time storing of data. TLS uh, 1.2 needs to be deployed as widely as soon as possible. And I think we should get away from all these overly complex systems like PGP and OpenSSL and, so, and stuff. And uh, one refreshing alternative is Nutzel from Daniel J. Bernstein again. Uh, it's actually pronounced SALT. And it's an incredibly simple system with uh, very modern and, and widely attacked and renowned algorithms. All the algorithms has been tested in uh, international cryptographic competitions. So it's pretty solid stuff. It's simple. It's a very simple and high level interface. I, I use it with much love myself on, on very often on a daily basis. Lots of tools that are incredibly uh, interesting, like WIF is a multi-party com uh, multi uh, multi -party computation tool. You can do all kinds of multi-party communications over the internet. It's like a twisted Python-based tool. Open transaction is actually the thing, the anonymous payment that we should be all looking at instead of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just accounting. Um, Dust and Goldbach are some tools that just appeared. I don't know if they even belong on this list, but this post node and hysteria uh, just threw up so much uh, tools that I think we should have should, should look at these. I mentioned Steed. I think an interesting tool, tool to use is also TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, for some kind of things. You, we need to review what is possible, what is not. Curve CP as a UDP-based uh, communication protocol. Uh, Pond seems to be the protocol that I almost implemented myself, but I didn't go to the end, and Andrew, Andrew Langry actually did. And uh, Pond is, seems to be a pretty cool thing that needs a lot more testing and review, but um, it's in written in Go, has lots of dependencies, and I failed to compile it yet. Um, I lay I'm suck, yeah. Um, and then CGDNS seems to be also a pretty exciting network that, that needs a bit of scrutiny and maybe more wide deployment. So, and to quickly, I have only a few slides left. Uh, my, my own contribution to this whole thing, I came up with a tool called PPBP. Uh, you see, um, I don't like um, vowels um, and, and like shitty names. Um, um, so this is actually all my gripes that I have with PGP. I, I try to solve them. So Actually, all the output that it outputs, it's totally mostly random. There's, it's very difficult to fingerprint. Um, also, the symmetric encryption provides authenticated encryption. Everything is based on elliptic curve cryptography, or the, the algorithms and, and sort. And I have implemented a naive uh, multi-party elliptic curve key exchange protocol. So we code all exchange keys in the room using this, also in this tool. Um, but I want to get go a bit further because host security is also imp important. Again, as I said, on a malware infected host, you don't want to store private keys. Maybe you want to change your firmware to core boot. Uh, maybe you want to install GR, GR security and packs for active um, uh, security on your Linux kernel. You really want to have full disk encryption. You know, Anakata didn't have, and all his uh, disk uh, contents were used against him. Um, I told you about the firmware-based backdoors. I think what is also very prudent to do is uh, data minimization. Simply do not store all your shit on your computer. Move it to offline storage. When you get owned, you, you get less owned. Uh, you get, the adversary gets less data of you. Do not store 15 uh, years of emails on your computer. You don't need that. Do not store your emails and your, uh, your pictures, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is important. Tails is a very nice distribution that you should try out uh, for ephemeral things. Physical security that I already mentioned. Um, I think um, there's a lot of like also having maintaining physical access to your to your devices where you handle your your crypto keys and you do your key management, and then of course external crypto devices. And here's my second uh, contribution to this field. Uh, I want to build a crypto key. A crypto key is basically uh, a cryptographic device which we can use for doing. Um, um, secret generations, so we can share secrets when we meet in person, and we can exchange those, and then we can use those secrets um, for seeding symmetric cryptography that is safe against um, post-quantum crypto um, methods. 
Um, this whole thing will work over 2.4 giga gigahertz radio, so we can be in the same room and exchange keys. Uh, it has a small display where we can uh, compare the hashes of our keys that we exchanged so that we can actually be sure there was no active man in the middle attack. Uh, it has two hardware random uh, sources, uh, and it has two key four keys for inputting some kind of, um, of pins. It has a battery, a USB, and two micro SD slots. The two micro SD slots can be used to uh, if you put two SD cards into that, it generates it full with one one-time pad in two copies, and then the two copies can be taken away, and you can use that as a one-time pad, actually. Um, but also, two crypto keys can connect and then exchange keys. And if, if you want to use this crypto key, you stick it in your laptop, and you do all your cryptographic operations on the crypto key, so your key material is never exposed to your, your, your host ever. Um, um, basically, that's the idea, and, and using um, this kind of crypto, like salt-based crypto, elliptic curve cryptography, etc. So, and then there's for I guess this is I think the last slide. This is not a topic of the talk. Um, two, one year ago, someone came up with some Bayesian arithmetics, where he claims that um, this provides polynomial time the deterministic factoring algorithm. While no um, blah blah blah. This clearly appears for evaluation of the current crypto system. So actually, this guy he can uh, factor pro, uh, numbers in polynomial time with this. If anyone has some, um, I have linked this paper, or I can provide you this paper as well. I'm very interested in what you think about this. But um, this is these are my links to most of the things that I listed here, um, and then I can also provide you with all the papers that I um, uh, reference. And basically, this concludes my talk. Thank you. I confirm this is my key. <coughs> Fingerprint. Any questions? Uh, you said that uh, S script and PBKDF2 can be used for, uh, for generating keys for passwords. And I would say that PBKDF2 should only be used if you're in a restricted environment and you have a boss who says that you can only use uh, really long letter combinations, which is approved by certain organizations. The, 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 uh, you're correct. And there's also one other restriction with script. You actually, since script also expands the key material in memory, you cannot operate in constrained memory um, 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 uh, environments. So with script, you actually expand the key material to 32 megabytes, and then you pick out separate <coughs> bits from various parts of this 30 byte, 32 megabyte big block of random data. So, so this doesn't work in, in embedded systems. Also, script doesn't work there simply, but in big systems, it does work. But this is exactly the point. So it cannot work in massively parallel situations, right? But if, if, if you have a constrained environment, of course, you should stick to, to PBKDF2. Yeah. I showed only two equations. <laughs> Was that even too much? <laughs> More questions, please. If you mix multiple sources, then it's a good source. And you should always mix multiple sources, please. This should be remembered. Okay, thank you then very much. <laughs>